Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode in my mystery series where today we're going to be talking about the mystery of Oak Island. This story sounds like it should be the plot of a book or a movie but this is real life. A small island off the coast of Nova Scotia, Canada that has been the focus of the world's longest and most expensive treasure hunt. What treasure are they looking for I hear you ask? Well, literally anything and plenty has actually been dug up over the years. This is something a little bit different from my usual mysteries, but I do like to do something a bit lighter hearted every now and then. We all need a break from true crime sometimes, and I honestly found this one fascinating to research. I really enjoyed making this video. But first, I want to give a huge thank you to Magellan TV, the documentary streaming service for sponsoring this week's video. I'm sure you've all already heard over the years why I love Magellan TV so much, so instead of listing all the reasons today, I'm just going to jump straight in and tell you about a documentary that I watched recently and know that so many of you would find fascinating. It's called What Happened to Holly Bartlett? This is a really well done true crime documentary about the unexplained death of 31 year old Molly Bartlett, a blind woman from Halifax in Canada. After a night out with friends, which had ended with them putting her safely into a taxi, she was found lying unconscious under the McKay Bridge. She was sadly pronounced dead in hospital the next morning, and although the authorities pronounced her death a tragic accident, her friends and family have their doubts, and they fought for the truth for over a decade. Through computer animations, dramatic recreations, and interviews, this documentary explores what exactly happened to Holly that night. This has inspired me to maybe cover her story in a video soon because there's still so many questions here that need answering. If you want to try out Magellan TV for yourself and watch what happened to Holly Bartlett, then you can click on the link in the description to claim your one month free trial. They have more true crime and history documentaries than you could even dream of. So let's begin by getting an idea of the geography here. Oak Island is a 140-acre privately owned island on the south shore of Nova Scotia, Canada. It's in Mahone Bay, a collection of 360 islands with plenty of wildlife and it's a very popular sailing area. You have everything in Mahone Bay. You have forests, rocky shores, beaches, wetlands, mud flats. It's basically a whole ecosystem in itself. Oak Island is located on the western side of Mahone Bay. The island is less than a mile long by half a mile wide with rocky shores and covered in relatively densely packed trees. Honestly, it looks like the exact kind of place you'd imagine when hearing the premise of this story, a treasure hunt. The enduring legend of Oak Island began two centuries ago, but it's worth bearing in mind that for many years this story was simply word of mouth, no written history appeared of it for decades. But the story goes that in 1795, a teenage boy called Daniel McGuinness was just wandering around Oak Island, exploring, when he came across a shallow, round depression in the ground. Some say that he'd been searching for a strange light he'd seen on the island from his parents' house on shore when he came across this depression. He noted that a number of oak trees that should have been in the area had been removed and that a block and tackle hung from a tree limb over the hole. A block and tackle being a pulley system using ropes to lift or drop heavy weights. All of this was enough to make Daniel wonder if there was something underneath his feet. The next day he brought back two friends, John Smith and Anthony Vaughan, who he convinced to help him dig down into this depression to see what was underneath. This could have just been dismissed as teen boys just trying to find something fun to do with their time and of course that was probably part of it, but they had a legitimate reason to believe that there could be something of value buried underneath. And that's because this area has always been notorious for pirates. It didn't take a lot of imagination to think that this collection of random, mostly uninhabited islands off the coast of Nova Scotia may have become a place where pirates would want to hide their stolen treasures. Daniel and his friends dug down in the depression and two feet below found a layer of flagstone. They pulled the rocks away expecting to find treasure underneath, but of course there was just more dirt. But they continued digging and it was clear as they dug that this area had previously already been dug up. This was a hole. 
they could see where the clay walls of the hole had been hit by pickaxes before, and each small clue would egg them on to keep digging. At 10 feet deep, the boys found a layer of rotting wood timbers across the width of the hole. It was a kind of wooden platform with the edges driven into the walls on the side to secure it. And when they knocked on the wood, it definitely sounded hollow. They must be close to the treasures underneath. So they removed the rotting timber, but there was nothing underneath, just a couple of foot of air before the soil started again. And this prompted a lot of questions. Why would somebody dig so deep and set up an entire pulley system just to bury nothing? Had the pirates already removed their treasures? If so, why would they fill the hole back in? The treasure can't have been buried there for long if it was. Unless there was something down there and maybe the holes and the tunnels were more complex. Undeterred and enjoying their mission, the boys carried on digging. This happening over the course of several weeks. At 20 foot deep, they found another wooden platform, and then another. The story goes they ended up digging down about 30 foot. I don't know how they got out of this massive hole. This original site would come to be known as the Money Pit, which you'll still find it referred to as today. Now, this story of theirs didn't actually appear in print for the first time until 1857, so over 75 years after it happened. This does leave a lot of room for error, for the story to get changed by word of mouth, for details to be exaggerated or omitted, but I suppose that stands for a lot of history. It wasn't for five years after the publication was printed until one of the original diggers, the now elderly teenage boys, came forward confirming this version of the story. But in the 75 years between their digging excavation and this story first appearing in print, a lot more had happened on Oak Island. The teenagers, forever intrigued by the mysterious endless pit, vowed that one day when they were able to get outside assistance, they would dig even deeper. And this outside assistance wouldn't appear for nearly 30 years. The oldest of the teenage boys, John Smith, would end up buying this area of land featuring the money pit, and in 1803, another man called Simeon Linz joined on their mission to dig after being convinced by the original boys. Never one to say no to a challenge, Simeon enlisted the help of locals Colonel Robert Archibald, Captain David Archibald and Sheriff Thomas Harris, and together they established the Onslow Company, the sole mission of which was to recover the mysterious Oak Island treasure. The mission really began in the summer of 1804 and they started to dig, noting all the same things the teenage boys had done 30 years earlier. Pickaxe marks in the clay walls, the marks where the wooden timbers had originally rested. At a depth of about 30 feet, one of the men hit a solid object, which turned out to be another timber platform, but this time they noted that it was sprinkled with charcoal remnants. They removed the platform and continued again, coming across another timber platform, but this time it seemed to have been sealed with some sort of like tree sap-like substance between each log. Was there something underneath that particular platform that needed this extra level of protection? I can imagine the excitement as they pulled up this one just to discover nothing, again. Still undeterred, they dug more. This time 10 foot below they found another platform, but this time there were scattered fibres of coconut shells, which is particularly baffling as coconuts are not native to Canada. Someone must have brought them in, likely from the Caribbean. Historically, coconut fibres were known to be strong and were often used to secure and protect valuable cargo. Could this be a sign that something was once there? They were 60 foot deep by this point and all they'd found were timber platforms, a bit of tree sap and some coconut fibres, no treasure to be seen. But they kept digging. Another 30 feet deep down they went, 90 foot deep in total, removing two more timber platforms until they finally found something. Here they found a stone, a large square cut stone tablet with an inscription of strange symbols, lines, arrows and dots. It was incredibly heavy as you'd expect, but they managed to get it to the outside world. Nobody knew what the symbols meant, but it was thought to be some kind of code. Not really knowing what to do with this stone, they just took it home for a bit. It wasn't until after the first article was published in 1857 that an actual academic was able to look at the stone and try and figure out what it meant. 
Although it's still thrown into question, a professor of languages from the Dalhousie University called James Leachy is thought to be the one who's provided an accurate translation. He thinks it reads, 40 feet below, 2 million pounds are buried. The tablet was found at 90 foot, so the treasure surely had to be at 130 foot deep. There was a lot of question over who had written this code. It was clearly written by somebody who either intended to come back or intended to send somebody else who understood the code. It was thought to be written in the British English of the time, and so rumours started to fly as to who could be responsible. The main man on everyone's lips at the time being that of a Captain Kidd. Captain William Kidd was a Scottish sea captain or pirate depending on who you ask and is often said to be the unluckiest pirate of all time. He was born in Dundee in 1654 and as an adult became a sea captain before moving to New York in the 1680s. During the war between England and France, he became a successful privateer, defending English and American trade routes, and was even commissioned by the English government to take charge in an expedition against pirates in the Indian Ocean. But Kidd wasn't very good at finding pirates, it turns out, and moved on one expedition to capture a man called Robert Culliford turned sour, so much so that Kidd was forced to become a pirate himself to stop mutiny. In January 1698, it's said that Kidd and his crew attacked a ship called the Kida Merchant and took ownership of its cargo. Mountains of extravagant fabrics, opium, iron, salt, sugar, and a lot of money, all things that were very high in demand. When Kidd had originally left on his mission two years earlier, piracy was frowned upon, but not technically illegal. What he hadn't realised was in this time, British law had outlawed piracy, and when he eventually arrived home, people were out for blood. He was forced to ask for a pardon from the government, saying his crew had forced him to turn to piracy. And then he sailed to Boston, stopping to bury treasure on Gardner's Island and Block Island along the way. Eventually, Kidd was actually arrested, and he was hanged back in England for his crimes on the 23rd of May, 1701. His story went down as folklore, each new generation telling the next. And thanks to how he was known for burying his treasure and the British English of the inscribed stone, his name has become synonymous with Oak Island. Could this really have been him burying his goods? Perhaps after some other of his treasures had been dug up, he realised he needed to get smarter with his hiding places. A possible suspect for sure, but it also could have been literally any other British pirate, or any other person. After the discovery of this inscribed stone, the Onslow company continued with their digging. Obviously, that wasn't the treasure they were looking for. They actually managed to reach 98 foot and reached another timber platform. And this was at the end of a very long day, they were tired and wanted to go home. But they also wanted to check underneath to make sure no treasure happened to be hiding. So they used a crowbar just to ease up a couple of the logs and make sure there was nothing underneath. There wasn't of course, so they went home. But whilst they were gone, disaster struck and the pit filled with water. And we're not talking a little bit of water here either. 60 foot of this now 98 foot deep hole was flooded. The men tried to empty the pit with buckets, but like, that's a big job, and it definitely did not work. So for a while, the excavation had to stop. Had they simply hit a spring in their digging, or had the hole been rigged to make this happen when they reached a certain depth? Was this just more confirmation of the treasure hidden below, or a sign from God to give up on their mission? Eventually, they hired a man with a big pump to come in and clear the hole, which worked for the most part until it didn't. When there was about eight foot of water left in the hole, the pump broke, and then they had no more ideas on how to fix the issue, so they went away to regroup. It was the next year that the Onslow company comes back fresh-faced and fresh-minded, ready to tackle the pit once again. Only this time they had another idea. Instead of continuing trying to dig down into this watery pit, they were going to excavate another one parallel to the original, with the idea that once they'd passed the water level in the other pit, they would just dig across and retrieve the treasure. Easy, right? They expected that this would only take a few weeks, and what I would do to have that level of optimism in my life. 
The next hole was 14 foot southeast of the original and all was going great until just after 12 foot water started to flood into the new one as well. This had used up the final money of the Onslow company and they had to admit defeat. They were never going to be able to reach this treasure. So the Onslow company moved on with their lives and the two pits remained filled with water for another 40 years until eventually in 1849, another group called the Truro Company took it upon themselves to finish the work with another member of the original teenage trio, Anthony Vaughan this time. They started with removing the water from the pit, but they faced the same brick wall the Onslow company had. Every time they removed the water, it would just reappear the next day. So they decided that they were going to find another way to get to the treasure and bypass the water with technology, by lowering a tool called an auger down into the water and into the ground below. An auger is a corkscrew-like tool designed for drilling through wood, and in this case, ground. They hoped this would give them an idea of what was underneath the timber platform previously found at 98 foot, the lowest anyone got before this whole water situation. They expected the auger to hit this platform, then hit a pocket of air, and then 10 foot or so of dirt before hitting another wooden platform. But that's not what happened, things seemed to change past 98 foot. They went through the usual dirt and then it hit a layer of rocks, then more timber and then clay. It was a new configuration, it was different than the predictability of the rest of the dig. They were sure this meant they had finally hit their treasure or they were reaching it. Apparently when they pulled the auger back up to the surface they found three small links of gold chain. Jackpot. So they try again, pushing the auger to 114 feet deep, and this time they found more evidence of coconut fibres. And then something weird happened with one of the men involved in the dig. After the auger was brought to the surface again, a man called James Pitblardo was seen wiping something clean for sneakily slipping it into his pocket. And then he left the island, not returning back for this dig. Soon though, he was petitioning the local authorities to let him conduct his own excavation. So what had he found that made him think that this was worth his time? I don't think he was ever granted permission to do this and must have been kicking himself because he wasn't then allowed to now redraw in Truro. But Truro eventually had to give up at the end of the summer season, returning in 1850 to continue their mission. I would be so worried that somebody else would sneak onto the island and figure out a way to reach this treasure before I got back the next year. In 1850, their big plan was to dig a parallel tunnel and reach the treasure that way. But haven't we heard that before? Of course, it didn't work before, it didn't work now, the water would flood that one too. It was around this point in time that they realised that this water was salty, that this wasn't part of some complicated booby trap put in place by the treasure barrier. This was just the sea, the tide, and there wasn't much they could do about that. In 1851, the Truro Company was forced to give up. In 1861, 10 years later, the Oak Island Association are the next to try, and they have all the same problems as the previous groups, Shock Horror. They did manage to get deeper with the two pits, the money pit and the parallel pit, 120 foot and 118 foot deep respectively, but then they would flood. And then the walls of the money pit collapsed in from 30 foot and down. It was only a matter of time until this happened, this wouldn't have been the strongest of structures and it's just lucky that no one would be hurt. But this flooding and collapsing wouldn't actually be the end of the world. In the last flood, the timber platform at the very bottom actually collapsed and the rush of the water cleared out whatever was underneath and the goods eventually floated to the top. They found the bottom of a yellow dish, a piece of juniper worked at either end and oak timber. The Oak Island Association continued on pumping out the water into a steam engine. But then one day this steam engine exploded and a man ended up dying. That didn't put an end to the search, but they were forced to eventually give up in 1866, and no one would try again for a while. The mystery would only be reignited again in 1890, when one and a half ounces of copper coin were discovered on the island, which people thought must have come from the pit. So in 1893, another new company is incorporated, the Oak Island Treasure Company, and they would have about as much luck as their predecessors. 
point to note here, a flooding, digging in the wrong tunnel, failed pumps, more death, and rumours of a curse. They continued with the auger technique and eventually they hit what they believed to be an iron surface, 126 foot. Impenetrable by the auger, they moved it a foot to the side and tried again, and this time it worked and they got down to 153 foot before hitting the same impenetrable surface. So they brought the auger back up and examined the debris stuck on it. And they found a piece of parchment and what appeared to have the letters BI written on it. This was a tiny piece of parchment, but it was unmistakable that that's what it was. Then in 1897, one drill operator called William Chapel found traces of gold sediment, but he would hide this for decades. Around this time, they came up with a theory that all of these holes led to a labyrinth of interconnected tunnels underneath the island. To test their theory, they poured coloured dye into the money pit and soon found the dye at the shoreline all around the island's perimeter. How was that possible? They just didn't know at this point. In 1931, William Chapel, the drill operator who found traces of gold sediment, would head back to the island to make his own attempt at excavation, but this would only last one season. They dug a brand new shaft and found an anchor flute in the side of the tunnel, something similar to a 250-year-old Arcadian axe, a miner's pick, and the remnants of an oil lamp. Outside of the pits, they found a strange stone formation in a triangular shape on the south shore of the island. They had to give up eventually when they ran out of money, but they did find some cool things. Then another man called Gilbert Hedden made his attempts, and he had a lot of money and knowledge in this kind of thing, so he thought he could be the one to do what so many others had failed at. Spoiler alert, he didn't. At around 65 foot deep, he did find a miner's oil lamp and unexploded dynamite, as well as a type of clay that hadn't previously been found on the island. At 114 feet, he found an intersecting tunnel about 3 foot 10 by 6 foot 4, lined with timbers, but then eventually he ran out of money and had to give up. In the 1960s, a man called Robert Restall made it his mission to uncover the treasure. He spoke with the owners of the island and said they would halve the treasures with them if anything is recovered in exchange for permission to excavate. Soon the whole Restall family moved to the island, they dedicated their whole lives to this pursuit. But in August 1965, Robert sadly died when he fell into a new shaft he'd been digging on the beach. There was said to be a noxious gas coming out of the pit which caused him to fall unconscious and then fall into the water, drowning. When his son Bobby saw this happening, he rushed over to help, but the exact same thing happened to him. Two other workers also ran to help, and the same thing happened to them. That took the death toll of Oak Island to six people. So then a geologist called Robert Dunfield takes over and uses bulldozers to clear 12 foot off the top of the money pit. They dug further and found shards of porcelain, but the tunnel just kept collapsing on them. So they refilled the money pit so they could start completely afresh just with the drilling. Surprisingly, that didn't work either. By this point in history, this area of Oak Island resembled somewhat of a mine. It was just dirt roads and multiple holes. Stuff like this continued over the coming decades. New people taking on the mission, then failing. Newer technology being used and failing. In the 1970s, a camera was lowered into the water and it was said to have videoed a stone chamber with a severed hand, a corpse and several treasure chests. But when they sent divers down to find them, they all came back empty handed. And then, as you can imagine with modern day laws and rules, a lot of legal questions started to rise around this excavation. If the treasure was found, who did it belong to? Who would have a right to it? What could ethically be done? Is it right to keep destroying this island to find this elusive treasure that might not exist at all? From the 1980s onwards, tourism opened up Oak Island all in an attempt to help fund the searches for the treasure. There were organised groups you can go and pay to be a part of and just be a treasure hunter for a day. It was and remains very popular. 
In the late 1990s, Oak Island went up for sale, and although the Oak Island Tourism Society begged for the government to buy it, the island was actually bought by two American brothers called Marty and Rick Lagina. You may recognise these names, as they're actually part of a TV show on the History Channel called The Curse of Oak Island, a reality show about a group of modern treasure hunters. It documents the modern day search of the island and the treasures they found over the years. Centuries old coins, an antique brooch and a lead cross made between four and eight hundred years ago. I'm sure they found much more than that over the years but they're currently nine seasons and eight years deep into the show and although I am dedicated to my research I'm not that dedicated. <laughs> what I did watch on YouTube though was fascinating, I really enjoyed it so I might make it my new watch when I'm bored. <laughs> It seems that in 2010 the Canadian government made a change to the Treasure Trove Act that oversees hunts like this one and replaced it with the Oak Island Treasure Act which discourages people from exploiting Nova Scotia's natural resources for commercial gain. Anyone who wants to search for and recover precious stones or metals in a state other than their natural states with the intent of keeping them would face heavy taxes and that's if they can even get the licensing to do so in the first place. That hasn't deterred the Laginas though, who I'm sure are making enough money with a TV show not to worry about being taxed heavily. There are so many different theories about who is responsible for this mysterious treasure. Captain Kidd, Marie Antoinette's missing jewels, William Shakespeare, the Knights Templar, but really it could literally be anyone in history. The Shakespeare theory comes from the parchment mostly, some believing that the pit hides his true identity. They believe that the real writer of Shakespeare's plays was Sir Francis Bacon, a recognised scientist and scholar who didn't want to be recognised as a lowly playwright, and he transferred his credit to Shakespeare. Some think this small scrap of parchment is proof of this, that it was one of the many writings of Bacon hidden forever. Why do they think this? Well, in one book, Bacon writes by his design of a perpetual spring, a self-flooding tunnel. Sounds familiar, but I thought we'd already figured out by this point that this was just the sea tide penetrating the earth. I think it's a bit of a stretch too, but some people really do believe that theory. The Knights Templar theory refers to some of the richest men on earth back around the 12th and 13th century, a devout group of Christians who are devoted to the protection of the sacred Temple of Solomon. These were the elitist of the elite, riches beyond the wildest dreams of the normal person. I should have got my girlfriend to talk about this one because she's obsessed with the Knights Templar and I can tell I'm not doing a very good job explaining it. But for the sake of this story, very, very, very rich men. But eventually, these riches they had disappeared. Where did it all go? Well, some theorise maybe the money pit. They certainly had the money and manpower to create a system such as this, and some believe that the stone with the code carved into it is a strong clue that the Templars were involved. But until the treasure's found, we won't know for sure the story behind it, and that's if it even exists in the first place. There was definitely something going on on Oak Island at some point. The weird wooden platform suggests that somebody had dug down there before, but we don't know why. Maybe somebody was trying to hide something, maybe somebody was just bored and thought this will be funny in the future, maybe somebody was trying to hide themselves. I do tend to think that if there was any treasure to be found it probably would have been found by now, but maybe I'm just putting way too much faith in modern technology there. There are a multitude of things on earth that are yet to be discovered. The biggest sceptics of the mystery say that the money pit is nothing more than a sinkhole, that you can find many of them right across Nova Scotia. The so-called treasures that the money pit has provided over the years may have simply been things washed in from the sea. I think that's a possibility for sure, I'm not saying that's not a possibility, but it's the wooden platforms that raise questions for me. Somebody had to have built them, they weren't naturally occurring, so why are they there? I think there are so many things in history that humanity today hasn't even begun to discover. I think there's a reason why there's this big hole, this big pit on Oak Island. I think there's a reason why somebody dug it. I don't think it necessarily has to be treasure, but there's a reason it's there. And I don't think we will ever really find out why. I don't think we'll ever find any treasure. But maybe I'm wrong. We don't know. This could literally be a case of somebody a few centuries ago thinking, you know what? I want to dig a really big hole. And they did it. 
and here we are today spending millions probably billions of pounds by this point on trying to find out what's down there and it could just somebody be trying to dig a really big hole i don't know how likely that is but it's funny to think about isn't it i can't believe it's taken me so long to look into this story it's been on my list for ages but it never took my fancy until now and this might actually be one of the most fascinating unsolved mysteries i've ever researched and i can't wait to hear what all of you think about this one do you think there's treasure buried underneath who do you think put it there what else could it be tell me all of your theories thank you so much for watching and i will see you in the next one bye guys